Zeiten. Hello, my name is Michael Holmes. I'm a freelance journalist uh, from Germany, a German-American freelance journalist. Uh, I'm specialized in global violence and modern history. And today I'm pleased and excited to talk to David Vine. Uh, David, you are a professor of political anthropology at American University in Washington, D.C. And you're also an expert on U.S. bases and the U.S. empire in general, its history and its current uh, its current uh, size and structure and so on. Uh, so thank you very much for joining us today, David. Michael, thank you so much. It's a, a pleasure to be with you. Let's, uh, let's uh, I first want to mention that today we want to talk about your latest book, which is called The United States of War. I believe it's an absolute must read for anyone interested in US foreign policy. In fact, for anyone interested in modern history, because you do show that the US empire was extremely important for modern history, like sort of taken over from the British empire in many ways. And uh, I also believe, um, well, if you want to understand a lot of conflicts today in the world, you cannot understand them without understanding what the United States did to so many countries. I would say this is a shocking uh, book. Sometimes it's sad. It is maddening. Um, but it's a necessary. It's necessary to look at that. So uh, I want to just mention your two other books. Uh, the first one was Island of Shame, which tells the story of how the United States and Britain forcibly displaced the indigenous people of Diego Garcia an island in the Indian Ocean to build a U.S. military base. That's a very sad story. They killed all the dogs also. Uh, so I was, I was shocked to read about it. Um, your second book uh, is called Base Nation, and it shows a vast network of U.S. military bases around the world, uh, which have all too often brought disaster to the local people and, of course, to the rest of the world by uh, enabling all the wars and aggressions of the United States, but also like the bases themselves brought a lot of harm all over the globe. Um, but your latest book is, in my opinion, the most important. It's called The United States of War. And you also uh, write a lot about the importance of the base system which uh, started right with the War of Independence against Britain and then it expanded first over the United States and then uh, over time, over the entire globe, culminating in World War II, but then also in the Cold War and up until today, uh, making the United States, the, I think it's fair to say, the greatest empire in history. The only comparison would maybe in some ways be the British Empire, uh, and maybe you could also say something about that comparison later on. Um, but let's start with this uh, first question. Uh, oh, one more, one more thing I have to mention, and that's the maps in the book. The book, book has 28 maps, which are amazing because they show you, uh, most of them show the whole world, some of them show a region, and they show you all the United States uh, military bases, and they also show you major wars and military interventions and things like that. And those maps give you an impression. They show you the United States has been all around the world for many decades and for the last two centuries, causing a lot of harm and damage in every world region uh, and in most countries of the world, uh, probably in all of them, but uh, some more and, and some less. So uh, would you start, um, please, David, uh, give us some basic numbers about the size and the structure of the U.S. empire today? Where, where are we? What does it look like? I think I might start with <clears throat> just that word empire. I, I, I know the way in which you, you meant it, but to describe the United States as the greatest empire in history, uh, maybe the most powerful, I guess, is, is certainly one of the ways we might describe it. Uh, as you 
rightfully pointed out, the, the effects of, of US empire, like empires before it, and the Russian empire currently, we might also say, uh, have been catastrophic, disastrous, horrific for millions upon millions of people. Uh, this was not, of course, the view I grew up with. I, like many people in the United States, bought into the mythologies about the United States so as being a force for good and, and democracy and mm. spreading freedom around the world and uh, kind of history that, that I grew up with and most people in the United States grew up with that, that celebrated the United States, a profoundly nationalist history that uh, not only celebrated but, but profoundly overlooked and erased uh, this long history of, of wars, offensive uh, wars of choice that have benefited a small group of elites, elite corporations and elite politicians and others who have benefited from uh, making use of, of the U.S. military to wage wars that have been in their interest but have not served the interests by and large of the vast majority of people in the United States and, and the vast majority of people around the world. Uh, that's the broad arc of the story that I try to tell in the United States of War, uh, which shows how the United States grew as an empire, as you said, growing out of and inheriting the uh, power and uh, territorial control of prior European empires, specifically the empires of Spain, Britain, France, uh, and others that colonized the Americas. The United States begins as a small collection of British colonies on the east coast of North America and grows into a global power. It colonizes, conquers, uh, lands across North America to the Pacific Ocean, displacing, murdering millions of Native American peoples in the process, uh, dispossessing them uh, and, and conquering them, and then begins seizing territories out, outside of North America, uh, islands in the Caribbean, islands in the Pacific Oceans, in the Pacific Ocean, excuse me, uh, and in the 20. 20th and 21st centuries, the United States has become a, a slightly different kind of empire and a, a new kind of empire that, of course, relies profoundly on its, its military power, also its economic and political power, much of which we've seen on display in recent months in the war in Gaza in particular, a genocidal war. But the United States has become, since World War II in particular, I would say, defined by two important qualities, two important characteristics that have defined the U.S. empire. One is an unprecedented collection of overseas military bases, military bases outside U.S. territory on other people's lands. Currently, there are somewhere between 750 to 800 U.S. military bases in around 80 foreign countries and colonies, that's 750 to 800 military bases in around 80 foreign countries and colonies. And that, that's more foreign military bases than any people, empire, or, or country in, in world history. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, people living in, in Germany know well the, the presence of, of US bases and have had complicated relationships with these bases and, and bases in different countries have had different effects largely tracking with the degree of, of democratic legitimacy of, of those bases. The, the other characteristic of U.S. empire since World War II that is particularly important to point out is, is the force really at the heart of U.S. empire today, and that is the, the military-industrial complex, the military-industrial complex that our President Eisenhower identified and warned the country about as he was leaving office in 1961. This uh, system involving uh, the military contractors, weapons makers, and other Pentagon contractors, uh, the military itself, the Pentagon that controls the military, and Congress, which together have uh, served to keep the United States locked in 
effectively endless perpetual war since World War II, a whole variety of wars that have killed millions upon millions of people. Just the last 22 years alone, since the George W. Bush administration launched its so-called war on terror, these wars, the most violent, bloody, awful of the wars in Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iraq, Syria, and Yemen have killed an estimated 4.5 million people, 4.5 million people, while injuring tens of millions and displacing 38 millions. The, num the numbers become so large, it, it actually becomes numbing and can uh, yeah. dehumanize the, the, the lives, the people who have died in these wars. But I think we have to look plainly directly at the, the effects of these wars and, and use that as, as motivation to, to change this system of, of mass death. Uh, and that certainly is what has motivated me to write the, all three of my books and, and, and conduct the work that I, I'm involved in. Yeah, I just want to mention, I think a lot of people right now are really shocked, especially young people, um, about uh, what the West, how the West is supporting the US and also Germany, uh, supporting the uh, slaughter in Gaza. By now, I think it's fair to call it the genocide, um, depending a little bit on your definition, but by now, I mean, it's almost uh, <laughs> pretty obvious, actually. And um, I think when you read, when I read your book, you know, it's it's not that surprising. I'm still a little bit shocked and surprised that they're still doing it. Like it's the 21st century. Like, come on, it's like the worst crime right now on the planet. Uh, maybe with the exception of Sudan. Um, but uh, you know, your book is full of crimes uh, like that. I don't want to get to that a little bit. Can you uh, uh, specific question? How many of those bases? You say 800 of them. How many of them are located in dictatorships? Yeah, that's an important point because the the justification for maintaining so many bases and hundreds of bases, hundreds of thousands of, of US military personnel around the world in other countries, the justification has long been that they have spread, spread democracy and kept the peace. Right. The op the, the, this is nothing close to the truth. Uh, this huge infrastructure of bases around the globe have helped to serve as a launch pad for, for US wars. The US wars in Iraq and Afghanistan most recently, but wars before it in Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, uh, wars in Korea and, and far beyond. Currently, around half of the countries and colonies hosting U.S. military bases are, are uh, run by undemocratic regimes, uh, dictatorships oh. indeed, and other, uh, other less than democratic regimes uh, in where U.S. bases are actually serving to prop up uh, undemocratic regimes and thus block the sp spread of democracy. Can you give us a, a rough idea? Uh, first of all, th that's really important to point out, half of them, to just emphasize this, of the 800 military bases are, or half of the countries where they're located in are dictatorships or extremely authoritarian. Some, some of the worst in the world, actually, like Saudi Arabia. Um, so um, how, how does this compare to China, especially, but also like to Russia? Like, uh, is, is China's, uh, are China's uh, foreign military bases uh, even comparable to that in any way? Is it the same dimension? Not even close. China and, and Russia are, are empires of a kind, but their power pale in comparison to the power of the U.S. empire currently. Uh, the military budgets of both countries are a small fraction of the, of the military budget of the United States. China is, is, is significantly larger than Russia's. Russia is about a tenth, perhaps, the size of of the US military budget and, and China spends about uh, one third to a half of what the United States, that is US taxpayers spend every year on, on its military and war. Uh, the same is true with the collection of, of military bases, even more pronounced the, the difference. Uh, China has a very small handful of 
anything we might call foreign military bases. There's a Chinese military base in Djibouti where the United States also has uh, actually two military bases. Uh, and China has a small handful of, of bases on human-made islands in the South China Sea. There are signs that there's also a base in Cambodia, uh, but uh, the, there is nothing of a, a collection of Chinese military bases encircling the globe in the way that U.S. military bases do. Russia has a, a slightly larger collection, um, almost entirely in former Soviet republics, uh, as well as in Syria. Uh, Britain and, and France have, have larger collections, and, but, but they too, their, their collections number in the, in the dozens, uh, not in the hundreds upon hundreds. And at, at times, there have been even more U.S. military bases abroad at the height of the U.S.-led wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. There were upwards of 2,000 U.S. military bases abroad. Uh, again, these are not just propping up democracy, uh, excuse me, propping up dictatorships and blocking the spread of democracy. These are bases that have been the infrastructure for war, the infrastructure for war since 2001 and the infrastructure for a long series of wars. And part of what my work does, my, my book, The United States of War, shows is that US military bases abroad, extraterritorial military bases, have served this function really since the earliest days of the existence of the United States. It was military bases, U.S. Army forts on Native American people's lands that allowed the conquest and colonization of, of the United States across North America in the 18th and 19th centuries. And in the 20th century, U.S. bases abroad, U.S. bases overseas have played a similar role. Although, again, uh, since World War II in particular, the global collection of bases has become one that's uh, unprecedented, far larger than any country or empire currently or in existence previously. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that because the U.S. empire also changes character a lot. Um, it's, it's, it's very complicated, more complicated in many ways than the British empire even. Uh, and in the beginning, uh, it should be characterized as a settler colonialist um, land empire which makes it more similar actually to, to Russia and China uh, and less so to, to Britain and France. Um, it's not a judgment call, but you know, it's like a, as, as the character of it. And this you describe really the, 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 the cruelty of it, you describe uh, very well. And also like uh, huge parts of the United States is just stolen land basically, uh, for, mostly from uh, native, uh, native tribes, the indigenous people. But also from Mexico, they, the United States stole uh, half of the country. And uh, uh, my partner is Mexican and, and you know, most Mexicans, um, all Mexicans are still angry about this. And they, they wonder what, if, the, uh, uh, if the U.S. will ever apologize for it and for many other things they've didn't done to the country. And everybody in Mexico knows this, but almost no one in the United States knows it. Um, so uh, at first you show it was like a... a a land empire expanding with brutal ethnic cleansing, in many cases, genocide, like in California. And um, that's, a, that's a shocking read. And, uh, you know, it's also interesting that there, it, it, it's always been an imperialist nation. Today, we don't see the beginning like that because they just conquered what is today US territory. And of course, most people in the world would recognize that as legitimate territory, so would I. But um, you would still recognize what you've done to people by taking it by force. And then uh, you um, you show that even before the Spanish-American War, but mostly starting with that war, at the end of the 19th century, the U.S. really goes global very early. It's not yet the strongest empire that is still Britain, but it's becoming, it's it's getting there. And can you describe a little bit uh, the U.S. global expansion uh, between the Spanish-American War and the World Wars uh, until World War II? Sure. It's in the first half of the 20th century, roughly, the United States really stops seizing new territories in a formal sense, in any, uh, in a, in any formal conquest, and instead begins to control other lands through a variety of other means. Uh, in Latin America in particular, 
including Mexico, there is a long series of U.S. invasions, wars, and, and occupations that date back actually to the, to the 19th century. But in the 20th century, we see long occupations of countries like uh, Honduras and, and Haiti, um, uh, multiple invasions of, of Mexico. I, I should mention that I'm actually now speaking to you from, from occupied Mexican territory, land that, of course, is, is twice occupied. It's, it's land that was mm. uh, seized from, from Mexico and, of course, before it from the native inhabitants of, of the land that we now call California. Uh, but uh -huh. uh, bases and invasions and occupations become hallmarks of the U.S. empire leading up to, to World War II. It is important to note that, that this history of, of conquest, of, of war, of empire uh, that the United States that has, has been involved in and that U.S. leaders have, have led the country into uh, has not been unbroken. Uh, and there's nothing inevitable about the United States behaving in this way or the United States becoming an mm -hmm. empire or expanding in perpetuity. And like all empires, uh, empires come to an end. And the only question is when the U.S. empire will end. But, but I think it's important to point out that in the years leading up to World War II, uh, our President Roosevelt actually pursued a different kind of relationship with Latin America in particular, described mm -hmm. as the good neighbor policy, which was far from, from, from perfect. Um, but attempted to uh, embrace a, a, a strategy of, of non-intervention, of, of ending the pattern of, of U.S. invasions and wars in Latin America, and, and, and did so uh, largely. Uh, and this is uh, something that still is a choice that U.S. leaders could pursue. And, and I'm you know, part of a, a group of, of many people who are struggling again, to, to make the United States more peaceful, to break this pattern of, of endless war that, of course, now is, is uh, in some ways more horrific than, than ever in the support that the U.S. government, along with the governments of Germany and other governments, have provided for, for the Israeli genocide in Gaza. Now, uh, just because you said something uh, where the U.S. sometimes try to have a better relationship there with Latin America, but I, I would like to point out, because for this region, the U.S. is uh, uh, particularly important because, uh, you know, in many ways, it's been independent since the 1820s from independence from Spain and, and Portugal in the case of Brazil. But um, this independence was really, I mean, it was almost like the U.S. like semi-colonized uh, Latin America, and your book also shows that. Because um, you have like these numbers, it's, it's always hard to remember like how often the United States invaded like Nicaragua and the Dominican Republic and Panama. And first of all, they've been in every Latin American country, occupying them, organizing coups and all that. Uh, can you say a little bit, a little bit more about that? Um, you said something positive, which is which is fine because they did some good also. But um, about the harm that the United States caused in Latin America specifically over the last sure. 200 years. Well, yes, uh, it is. It is profound, uh, beginning with the the land seized from Mexico. But in, indeed, uh, the United States has invaded and or occupied uh, most of the countries in in Latin America, uh, and uh, has used bases and other forms of military force to not just for the sake of exercising military force, but almost exclusively for advancing corporate interests, the interests of, of powerful business people, of powerful elites. Uh, and, and then that is, the, the, of course, the, the larger story of, of the expansion of the United States across North America and, and, and in Latin America and globally, mm -hmm. uh, that this has not been, has never been expansion just for expansion's sake, but has specifically advanced the economic interests of, of particular people, of particular corporations, and this remains the case to this day. Um, but the, the toll in, in Latin America has been horrific, uh, dating to the, to the 19th century, uh, but more recently in, in Central America in particular, the way in which uh, the Reagan administration and, and other administrations backed the uh, right-wing dictatorships and their wars in Guatemala, El Salvador, 
uh, and the, the right wing uh, Contra revolutionaries uh, who were uh, struggling in, in Nicaragua, these wars in Central America uh, took the lives of hundreds of thousands of people in, in Guatemala in particular, it's widely been described as a genocide, genocide right. by the United States. Right, thank you very much uh, for clarifying that. Um, can you tell us a bit then about the, the, the Cold War? Because uh, a lot of people still see like the Cold War as, I think every nobody is like totally naive. Most people know that the United States have done some bad things in, in Vietnam and other places in, in Chile in 1973. But the overall view still is like in the Cold War, United States and its allies like NATO were the good guys. And then there was like the evil Soviet Union. And uh, I mean, I have to say, I, I grew up in, in West Germany. Now I live in East Germany and I love it here, but um, I'm still glad I grew up in West Germany and not in the GDR. But um, that's about the internal system. Um, but I personally don't believe that the, the foreign policy of the United States was any better than that of the Soviet Union. In fact, in, in many cases, I think the, the United States and the West supported the worst, um, the, the worst of the two sides, not always, but oftentimes. And uh, it's, uh, that's a much more complicated picture, in my opinion. How, how do you see that? And what can you tell us about the, the Cold War period? It is a, a complicated picture, but I, I, the way I would start is, is with the very term Cold War. Uh, the war that, uh, and state of, of global affairs after World War II up until 1989, 1991, uh, there was nothing cold about it. There were literally millions upon millions of people who, who died in wars backed by both the United States and the Soviet Union. And, the larger NATO alliance, as well as the, the Eastern Bloc alliance. Uh, there was nothing cold at all for the people of Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, for people in Indonesia, where perhaps a, a million or more uh, died in what also has been described as a, a US-backed genocide, um, among many, many other places. Uh, the US, of course, and NATO supported dictatorships in uh, within the NATO alliance itself in Portugal and, and Spain, the dictatorships that, that took many hundreds of thousands more lives, if not millions, um, including in wars in Africa waged by the Portuguese dictatorship. Right. Uh, so I think it, it's really critical to see the, the complexity of, of, of this period that, that is still referred to as the Cold War, which of course erases the deaths and, and suffering that, that went on um, in a, during a period of, of imperial competition between the United States and the Soviet Union that thankfully did not uh, end up uh, erasing all of human existence on Earth thanks to uh, a nuclear war, um, but that, that you know, essentially uh, created nuclear-like devastation in places like Vietnam. I'm glad you mentioned uh, NATO support for Portugal's wars in Angola and uh, Mozambique, because I think it's a completely underestimated topic, like horrific crime to support that, because Portugal was really brutal in its colonies. But uh, next question, like you have a, a map in the book that shows all the U.S. Basic, bases which surround China, Russia and Iran. And, and it's it, very interesting to see, <laughs> because like those countries are very much surrounded by big U.S. military bases and smaller ones everywhere. And you have another map, which is a fictitious map. It doesn't show anything in reality. Um, the map shows, like, if you would imagine that Russia, China, and Iran would have the same number of military bases around the United States. So basically, the map shows uh, Chinese, Russian, and Iran Iranian bases, and North Korean, I think, um, in Canada, and Mexico, and Cuba, and, 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 uh, and further south, over, all over Latin America. And, and it's, just like, it's like roughly the same number, so that the maps are actually the same. And then you ask the question, how would Americans feel? And in this case, it's actually sort of a rhetorical question, because it's very clear they would not like it. You know, and it's something that John Mearsam especially uh, has always pointed out, political scientist who says like, 
Um, if you put yourself in the shoes of Chinese or Russians, you would see the United States as a very aggressive empire, like encroaching on your borders, threatening you, threatening your people, and you would really feel like you have to do something about it. That's uh, you know not justifying all the behavior, not at all, of, of Russia, China, or Iran. Um, they're all guilty of horrible crimes, especially Russia recently in Ukraine. I've been to Ukraine. I don't want to minimize it. Um, but that's a very interesting idea, this this map. You've done it. Um, do you think, like, can you tell us some more about this idea? Like, uh, do you think we could help um, end or de-escalate those great power hostilities between the United States and China, United States and Russia, United States and Iran and Venezuela and other places by trying to get people to put themselves into the shoes of the other side? And I have to say, also in the the people on the other side, not just the leadership, like put yourself in, if you were Russian, if you were Chinese, like an ordinary citizen, wouldn't you be afraid of NATO? Wouldn't you be afraid of all these uh, threats against your country? And also, wouldn't you not be outraged about how they, with the arrogance with, with which they talk about your country? Um, you know, because that's the psychology also plays a certain role. I mean, most people around the world, including Americans, including Germans, have a some sort of basic uh, patriotism or nationalism. And if you like insult them and look down on them, they feel that and they react to it. It's just natural. Sometimes it's crazy and creates more problems. But, uh, you know, I, you're basically showing with this map, they're not so different from us, right? And uh, so how does it feel like from the other side? Can you can you uh, tell us what you, how you feel about that? Sure, I, I will say, you know, to begin, we, we must, de-escalate the growing tensions between the United States and its allies and, and both Russia and China, because this really is the most dangerous moment, I think, in, in, in my life for the globe, mm -hmm. um, given the, the growing threat of a direct military uh, clash or war between the United States and its allies and Russia or, or China or both, which of course could easily spiral out of control into a, a nuclear war that could take the lives of, of billions of people, if not uh, endanger all of human existence on earth. I, I should say that as you, you, I think beautifully put it, the, the map you referred to does encourage people to, especially people in the United States, uh, to think about how it would feel to live in China or Russia or Iran and to be surrounded by US military bases. Uh, people in the United States generally, I think, can't conceive of how it would feel to have even a, a single Chinese or Russian military base anywhere near our mm -hmm. borders. And, and the, the maps do in, indeed try to encourage uh, feelings of, of empathy even and, and trying to see the world from the perspective of others. I, sh I should point out that that map that you described and all the, the maps from my book, The United States of War, as well as the, the maps from my previous books are available on my website, davidvine.net, mm, right. so they can be downloaded. Um, we'll, we'll put a link to your website and then people can look at it. And then they should look at it, you know, especially if, if they don't buy the book because it's not out in German, uh, which is uh, a tragedy. Uh, I'll try to make that happen. <laughs> um see if i can find a translator but if it's not out in german and some of our readers the english is not that good look at the maps please we'll put a link to that and maybe we'll can have some in the video on the side or something but we'll see yeah um yeah next question i let's play a little bit like the uh, um advocado siaboli um because i want to ask you like if you think the u.s empire has done some good by the way it's so big it's been around for like 250 years. It would be really strange if it would have done nothing good, right? <laughs> um, I think every large country has done something good for its neighbors and whatever. One reason being that you need alliances and stuff. If you only make enemies, you're not going to last long. Look at the Nazi empire. Um, but um, still, it's a good question um, if, if the US has done some good. And I mean, I'm German, I'm German-American. Uh, in fact, I've been to many, many military bases in, in, in my childhood and, and youth because my dad worked for the U.S. Army, not as a soldier, but as a teacher. And uh, 
so the the question about if the US is doing any good was was always around and um my feeling always was it has done some good especially for Germany and Japan even so there i mean the US also supported the firebombing of German cities which was a horrible crime and it would look much more horrible if it wasn't for the holocaust in comparison you know um but still i mean i'm 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 glad that the nazi empire was defeated and one should point out 80% of the fighting was done by the Soviet Union, not by the United States or Britain. But still, they supported it, which is very important. Their technology, their money was very, uh, was crucial. And also, I I am uh, I am glad that I grew up in the West and not under communist rule. So, definitely as a German, I can say thumb thank yous to the U.S. Empire. Um, but I think it's quite exceptional. I think except for Japan, Germany, and Italy, it's pretty hard to find any cases where you could say this was a just war. Here, the United States is doing good. Um, what do you think about that? Can you come up with some more cases where at least maybe they've done some good? It is it is complicated. And, you know, I, in some ways, uh, owe my existence on Earth uh, to the United States. My uh, maternal grandparents fled Germany, um, uh, cities near the Dutch border, uh, uh -huh. as as Jews um, shortly before oh. World War II. And I don't know about that. Okay. Yeah, might might not have um, survived the war like many of their mm -hmm. relatives, uh, were it not for the United States uh, taking them in. And um, mm -hmm. so it is a, a complicated story. Um, I, I do think the question of, of looking for the, the good of, of, I think I would say that, that the United States as a country surely has, has uh, contributed positively to the world and, and to people in the United States in, in a variety of ways. Uh, I think yeah. as a configuration, the, the empire that is the United States uh, has, uh, again, contributed to massive death and, and destruction. The United States is a complicated empire because it is one that has possessed some degree of democratic rule. Of mm -hmm. course, a, a profoundly limited kind of democratic rule within the United States and that has supported undemocratic rule uh, on a global basis. Uh, so it, it is a, a complicated picture and, and that's why, you know, I, I end the book in, in, a, in a couple of ways. One, by trying to encourage people in the United States and, and the government to embrace a, a foreign policy and a mode of engaging with the re rest of the world that would embrace uh, the best traditions in, in the United States, traditions of democracy, of uh, respect for others, of, uh, of bill of cooperation. Um, I also call in, in toward the end of the book for the United States to, to really follow Germany's model, um, a, a model after World War II that looked squarely, however imperfectly, looked squarely at the, 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 the horrific violence that the Nazi regime imposed on the victims of the Holocaust and then all the victims of, of World War II, and, and not just looked squarely at it, but paid reparations, made some degree of apology and, and some degree of, of reparations to repair some of the damage. And the United States, uh, by and large, has escaped any responsibility for its past and, and current crimes. Uh, and that, I think, is, is part of what needs to change. Uh, the United States really owes uh, literally millions upon millions of people uh, repair uh, as well as apology uh, for the damage inflicted on on countries around the world, beginning, of course, with Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, um, but also in, in the past two plus decades. And let's just start with Iraq and Afghanistan. And uh, I again point to the, the figures um, that the Costs of War Project has compiled where uh, an estimated 4.5 million people 
have died in, in the wars, US-led wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, as well as the wars in uh, Pakistan, uh, Syria, and Yemen. Uh, there's very little awareness that the, of the scale of, of death and destruction, again, accompanied by tens of millions injured, 38 million displaced in these wars. 38 million is, is about the size of Canada, the entire population of Canada or, or California for that matter. Yeah. Similar size wow. displaced during these wars. Mm -hmm. And I think this is precisely what people in the United States and, you know, of course, the United States was not alone in, in the wars in, in both Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, NATO, of course, played a critical role in, in the, the war and occupation invasion of, of Afghanistan. Um, some uh, NATO allies, especially Britain, of course, played key roles in uh, the war in Iraq uh, that have been catastrophic disasters, such that, you know, the fact that that war has not been completely delegitimized as a foreign policy option for the United States is, is really hard to contemplate, but it speaks to the ideological power of the US empire to continue to perpetuate mythologies of the United States as, as a source for good and freedom and democracy. Uh, and that's part of what we need to take on. Um, as, as part of a, a really urgent effort to change the direction of, of the United States, to end the, the pattern of, of endless war, and to begin a, a path toward cooperation and working with others, including um, other empires, less powerful but still empires in the form of China and Russia, to confront the world's most pressing problems, the existential problems of global heating, climate change, um, as well as poverty and disease, among many, many others. Yeah, I, you know, I changed my mind, uh, became much more critical of Western foreign policy in general when, when traveling more for my journalism to the global south. And I remember speaking to young people in Iran, in Iraq, and El Salvador. And they all like they they all basically told me, uh, look, we love uh, we love democracy and secularism. We want more of that for our countries, and uh, we love uh, American movies, which are the best in the world. And we would like to study at a uni uh, American university and come back to our home countries. And uh, we like Americans. Most Americans we meet, we we like them. Sometimes they're a bit arrogant and stuff, but you know they they have a big heart and so on. They, they mostly had a positive view of the United States, but when you ask them about U.S. foreign policy and, and the history of it in, in Iran, in El Salvador, many other places, they were sick and tired of it. They're really angry. They're really sad. And it's not because they're extremists in any way. They, they hate their own you know, governments in, in Iran. They hate the, the mullahs and all that. Um, they will risk their lives to have democracy and secularism and freedom and women's rights. But they're sick and tired. One, one Iranian uh, young man told me, uh, I have two big enemies. That's my own government, uh, the, the crazy mullahs, and the United States and its allies, you know, Israel and Saudi Arabia and so on. And uh, that's such a tragic misunderstanding. Like the communication between the global south and the West is like, um, it doesn't get through. And in, in Gaza really also puts an exclamation mark on that misunderstanding. I'm really shocked that the West doesn't get it at all, how the rest of the world see it. And I would say the rest of the world is mostly right. Okay, Some people um, you know, downplay what Hamas did a bit too much and so on. I'm, they're not totally right, but I mean, they are right about what's happening in Gaza and they're shocked. And uh, so I, I really think that um, your book can also like help people in the West better understand ourselves, like what we've done to other countries. And, uh, you know, and in, in, in Germany, one of the most important debates is how do we relate to the United States? It's still among the elites. It's a complete taboo to, to break with it. And in fact, the, the smear campaign in Germany always goes like this. If you are like opposed too much to the United States, you're an anti-Western and you're like the Nazis because they always also hated the U.S. empire and so, so, so on and the British uh, and they hated the British, which is too simple, by the way, because in many ways they also admired it. But that's not the main point here. 
but they basically smear you anti-Western means you like the Nazi regime. You like you. Then they say you're pro-Putin, which most people are not on the in the peace camp and so on. So, um, how how do you think we can uh, better? Because you've also like uh, I haven't asked you about this. You've you've traveled to many of the those U.S. bases and the country where they're located in. Um, so you know that feeling. Um, how do you think we can? have better communication, honest communication, which would include some apologies, not just from one side, but from all sides in some cases. Um, how do we start to have honest conversations about this relationship between the rich and democratic West and, and the rest of the world? It's a very diff difficult challenge, and but it's, I think, one that we need to engage in and not just conversation, but really uh, a, a global movement is needed yeah. to demand that our governments uh, pursue a, a different path, a path not defined by war and conquest and, and genocide, but a, a, a path toward global cooperation. And, and I, th I think many people around the world, they, they get it that governments from the United States to Iran, to Russia, to China, to Britain, uh, to Germany and, and far beyond, they've been largely hijacked by a small group of, of economic elites, um, by, by politicians and, and corporations who are using governments and, and the powers of governments to wage war, especially the military power, uh, to advance their own economic interests uh, at the expense of the vast majority of people living on Earth. And Mm -hmm. So uh, we need um, desperately uh, a, a global movement to demand change, to demand uh, turning away from, from war, to demand an investment in, in human life uh, mm -hmm. rather than in, in the means of, of, of destruction, and uh, to demand that we collectively take on the, the real existential threats facing us, beginning with global heating, climate change, uh, as well as the threat of, of nuclear weapons that, that remain uh, hanging over our head uh, and could end human existence on Earth. Mm -hmm. You're thinking about uh, nuclear weapons now. Yes, With yeah, yeah. The last point. The, the, yeah, nuclear war, um, which, uh, you know, to uh, too great an extent has faded into the background of many people's consciousness since yeah. the end of the Cold War. Um, you know, Russia and, and the United States alone possess thousands of, of nuclear warheads uh, mm -hmm. that if, if any war broke out, nuclear war broke out between the United States and, and Russia or the United States, Russia and, and, and China, which possesses a smaller collection of, of nuclear weapons, uh, it, it could endanger all of human existence on Earth. Um, Princeton University has estimated four to five billion people could die in a full-scale nuclear war between the United States and, and Russia and, and endanger all of human existence. Uh, this you, said, you said billion, that's important to point out. You said yes, four sorry. to five billion people, which is like a little more than half of humankind, literally, Yeah, could be wiped out. Yeah, and, yeah. and in, with the entirety of human existence on Earth endangered. Um, and I think uh -huh. I may underestimate. I think the figure is five to six, five to six billion, five to six, so more than well over half of uh, <laughs> human life on Earth. Um, I'm laughing, but it's, it's a yeah. Well, it, it is un, it it is unimaginable. It should be unimaginable. And yeah. the fact that we live with this threat on a daily basis uh, should be unimaginable. But but we must imagine it because this is what we are living with. And, you know, Germany, people in Germany, people in Europe would be at the center of, of any nuclear mm. war or any war of any kind between the United States and, and Russia, for example. Uh, and, and, you know, this is part of what motivates me and gives me a, a tremendous sense of urgency that if we don't stop this system of, of war, uh, we are in danger of no longer existing as as individuals, as a species. 
Well, I don't want to end with the nuclear war because it's so terrible. Even so, it's important to to repeat that warning because it is absolutely possible, and we must avoid it at any cost. Uh, nuclear war, and it could happen with Russia or with China. Uh, but uh, to end on a positive, uh, more positive note, I think a lot of young people, uh, Gaza, like woke them up, uh, not just about this issue but about more general, about what the West is capable of. I hope they don't make the same mistakes as left-wingers have made in the past and just like have too much sympathy for Hamas or China or Russia. I hope they get the wrong inclusion. I think they do. I think most of them really understand this is, it should be about peace. Uh, it should be about um, criticizing your own government uh, first and foremost, because that's the job of anybody who wants peace. Um, I, I, you know, I, we, we can only hope that more Russians and more Chinese people will start criticizing their own governments more if they become too aggressive. But we have to start with our side because it doesn't take any courage to criticize Russia or China in Germany or in the United States. And if you do it, you could at least be misunderstood as um, encouraging war and aggression and sanctions and all that, making everything worse. Uh, I'm not saying you shouldn't do it, therefore, but you should, you know, like be aware of that problem. And um, but I hope there is a new generation who uh, is very critical of the West and gets this right and uh, makes sure that we can have more normal and peaceful relations, because it is not that hard. Um, we basically I think as long as we would be talking with China and Russia and Iran, we could really work things out and uh, get the world back on a, on a, a positive uh, path, because it often was, you know, it was not always, the world was for a long time getting better, I feel, after World War II, and uh, we could back get back there. I, I think, that, you know, I, I have probably painted a, a somewhat dire picture, and, and there's reason to be very depressed at the, the long mm -hmm. history of U.S. wars, the recent history of U.S. wars, the, the war in, in, in Gaza, among other um, reasons to be very discouraged and depressed and, and, and angry and outraged, uh, which I think is important. But there are reasons to be tremendously hopeful. I think you're exactly right that young people in particular have, have awoken to uh, the, 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 the war system in our midst. Um, that's why they're, you know, demanding divestment, not just divestment from uh, arms manufacturers and others backing the uh, U.S.-backed Israeli war and genocide in Gaza, but, but demanding divestment, certainly in, in this country, but also, also around, in, around the globe, mm -hmm. divestment from all arms manufacturers and all who are making profits off war and death and, and destruction and suffering. Uh, there is, uh, an, you know, across generations, people are, are sick of war, certainly here in the United States. Um, people long right. ago, thanks to the, the US-led wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, have, have turned their back on war and, and uh, shown they are, are sick and tired of war and want something else. And, uh, they want, you know, investment in, in human lives and and making the world uh, better and making their lives better and making all of our countries better. Um, this is possible. Um, I, I think we, we should remember how much money has been plowed into this war system in the United States and Germany, elsewhere. Um, the money is, of course, benefiting and, and going to the profits of the the the, the merchants of death, as they're often referred to, the, the war profiteers who are, are making money off the perpetuation of the, the status quo of the, the current war system. All the while, every dollar poured into that war system is a dollar we're not investing in building a green energy infrastructure to combat right. global warming, climate change. Uh, it's a dollar not spent to prevent a preventable death. It's a dollar not spent to cure cancer and other diseases. It's a dollar not spent to educate someone, to provide health care, uh, to ensure that no one on this planet goes hungry, to ensure that no one is, is homeless, as so many people in the United States at least are. Um, this is what we need to look plainly at. Uh, and uh, this is the system that we need to demand uh, a change. 
Um, and again, I would point to, well, I think you, you did very well, the, the growing number of young people and people across generations who are, are demanding something different. And we need to seize on this moment of really profound horror in Gaza and in other places like Sudan, for example, the Congo, among, among others, uh, to build on this moment of, of horror and, and create a movement that will lead our, our countries individually and the globe uh, into uh, the construction of a, a world, the world we want to see, a world defined not by death and war and destruction, but but by investing in human lives. And the, the uh, yeah. Well, I really encourage um, our viewers and readers to, to look at the book, get the book, read it. Uh, it's so informative. Uh, it's it's amazing how you really show the development. Like you, you basically show the infrastructure of the U.S. empire and what it then does. And it's just interesting to see. It's 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 also a book of infographics. And if you like them, uh, and on this topic, um, so that's really uh, really cool about it. And I would also encourage young people to uh, to stand up and, and and learn about the world and uh, get engaged because we need peace. And we need to do something about climate change and we need to do something about inequality and poverty. And it's all doable because a lot of uh, people today um, are frustrated, think our elites are only corrupt. There's nothing you can do. You can choose only between Biden and Donald Trump. And that's that's your only choice. And um, that's not true. People have always made history. And your book actually shows that <laughs> your book actually shows that there was a lot of resistance to U.S. bases, uh, which is also a sort of source of hope and strength from Okinawa and also in Germany, by the way, and uh, many places. So uh, thank you so much, David. It was a pleasure. I learned a lot. I, I think our viewers and readers learned a lot. And um, best of luck, inshallah. Thank you so much, Michael. I really enjoyed the conversation. Appreciate your, your interest. And uh, I would only encourage more people to, as you said, um, not only educate themselves uh, as I'm trying to do on an ongoing basis, but but to get involved in in movements and efforts to to make the world a better place and, and build the world we, we really want to see. All right, I'll let you go with this. Thank you so much, David. Thank you, we'll Michael. Talk, we'll talk again, I hope. Take care.